be disciplined or you will be disciplined. This is true because any good leader uh, ultimately disciplines those that he cares about, right? And ultimately, God is the best disciplinarian. Now, if you don't discipline yourself, you're going to need to be disciplined because ultimately God is going to discipline the whole world. So which of those two better describes your life right now? Disciplining yourself or being disciplined by God? If your experiences are sweet right now, well, thank the Lord. Maybe you're disciplining yourself so that God doesn't have to get your attention. <laughs> but maybe you are experiencing sour experiences in your life right now. And in that case, you should also actually thank God because maybe this is just what you need for the Lord to get your attention. So are you listening? What I'm saying is whether you discipline yourself or whether God disciplines you, in either case, you should be thankful because in both cases, God can do his great work in your life. Are you really listening to what the Lord is trying to tell you in your life? Maybe he's trying to discipline you. The traditional character for the word listen in Chinese consists of six radicals. Okay. It, it means it consists of ear and king. The idea is wrap your ear around the king. Listen to what the king is saying. It consists of ten and I. Focus on the king with ten eyes, ten humble eyes, as if you had ten eyes. And then the last two characters are one and heart. Listen with one undivided heart. When we truly listen to someone, we treat him as a king or a queen. A servant never interrupts the king, but wraps his ear around him, attending every word and facial expression with, with ten eyes and one heart. So true listening gives the other person our full respect and undivided attention. You know, we do that with people. I think each of us needs to grow in terms of how we are skilled at listening to people, but how much more do we need to grow in terms of whether we're listening to God so he will not have to discipline us as if we're really not listening very well at all. So what should we do when we are disciplined? What? should we do when we are disciplined? Did you catch my double meaning here? Let's look at the background to what we're talking about in this particular study. I cannot be dogmatic about dating Joel, but the best option that I know of for Joel is that Joel took place about when when the Babylonians uh, took about 10,000 people out of Judah and they took them away in 597 BC. So I think Joel, even though some will put it quite early in the prophetic lineup, some will put it close to where Obadiah is or somewhere earlier here. It's, it's hard to date Joel because it doesn't actually give you the name of the king who was ruling at the time of Joel. But rather than putting it earlier, I'm putting it after Nahum and Zephaniah, really right around when the Babylonians have taken a huge amount of people out of the land of Judah and Jerusalem, away in exile. But the nation still hasn't been destroyed yet. Joel is still a, a pre-exilic prophet. The exile hasn't come yet. And I think Joel ministered during that 11-year time period between 
when the Babylonians took those 10,000 people in 597 up to the destruction of the city in 586. It was just after a locust invasion and just after a drought. I say this because Joel 3.3 3 says, they threw dice to decide which of my people would be their slaves. They traded boys to obtain prostitutes and sold girls for enough wine to get drunk. So th this is some kind of a pretty severe judgment that had just happened to the people, but it wasn't the full destruction of Jerusalem. We also see uh, in Joel that it mentions selling people to the Greeks, which also happened only about, only after 600 BC, when the Greeks became strong. We don't have the Greeks as a strong people earlier on, like in 800 or 700, which would have been a, making Joel quite an early prophet. He says here, what do you have against me, Tyre and Sidon, and you cities of Philistia? Are you trying to take refuge, a revenge on me? If you are, then watch out. I will strike swiftly and pay you back for everything you've done. You've taken my silver and gold and all my precious treasures and carry them off to your pagan temples. See, he's saying that the cities of Tyre and Philistia have taken these people uh, of Judah and sold them all the way over to the Greeks. We don't have the Greeks being a strong nation up until this time. The Greeks were not strong until about 600, 500 BC. 500 BC was actually the, the, the height of Greek power. So Joel probably has a later date, let's say right around the time of 600. And so what God actually did is as Jerusalem was heading toward its fall, he wisely and graciously uh, provided many people before 586. He provided Zephaniah to speak to them some 50 years earlier. He provided Jeremiah there in Jerusalem itself. He provided Daniel as a godly man who uh, was taken as a young man over to Babylon. A similar sort of thing for Ezekiel who at age 30 was brought on over to Babylon. The Lord did not forget his people by bringing Habakkuk and also by bringing Joel. These are six of the prophets that were ministering during that time to God's people. In other words, God gave plenty of warning. He told them that the exile was going to come. He told them that Jerusalem would be destroyed and he did that through not just one man, but at least six or pro probably many more that, that did not write anything in our Bible. And eventually we see the Book of Lamentations looking back on all of that. And what he was actually trying to do is raise up all of these people, Joel included, to tell them that Nebuchadnezzar was going to be his instrument. Nebuchadnezzar was referred to as God's sword, God's instrument of judgment against his own people. In fact, Nebuchadnezzar considered himself as such. He says, your God told me to come and conquer you. <laughs> so God's instrument of discipline was this pagan Babylonian king. It's a good reminder to us that God can use whoever he wants for whatever purpose he is. And so today we're going to see what to do about uh, present difficulties. And then we're going to see how, how all these will turn out in the end. Okay. So what do we do now? And then how this will turn out really is the outline of what we'll see as we dig on into the book of Joel. And it, it relates to this whole concept of being disciplined or be disciplined so that we or do not have to be disciplined. So what should we do when we're disciplined? We should repent. Discipline should bring repentance. Uh, times of difficulty, this discipline that God brings in our lives, there really are great times to change our perspective. 
Sadly, many people go through these difficult things, ex experiences in life, and they don't ever seem to learn from it. And so their perspective doesn't change. They don't really repent. They don't have a change of mind in what they're, what they're supposed to be doing. And so frankly, they go uh, talk about the same problems. Uh, I have some people in my life, and my wife does as well. They come to us with the same problem they had months ago, last year, two years ago, five years ago, over and over, same problem, and we give them the same solution. Trust the Lord. Change your perspective. Let God work in your life in this. But when they do not allow God to do that, then there is no change in perspective. And what we see in Joel is that God had sent a repeated discipline in their lives, but they really didn't learn from them. These instances just caused them to be perhaps more angry against the Lord, but they certain did, certainly didn't lead to any change of perspective or change of behavior. And we see uh, disasters, a couple of them in the first 20 verses, followed by an invasion that he talks about in chapter two. This devastation should lead to repentance. And then eventually God would lead that devastation over to deliverance. So let's take a look and see how this bears out in the book itself. The Lord gave this message to Joel, son of Pethuel. It's nice to know that he was the son of Pethuel, but I, I wish he had said more than just Pethuel. It could help us to be more assured of the context here. But what was the message? What was the message God gave to him? Basically this, tell them about the locusts. The locusts had just devastated their land. God said, tell them about the locusts, and he expected Joel to respond uh, properly, to tell them what all of this really me meant. Joel was faithful to do that, even though he did not mention the king who was reigning at that time. Even Joel's name is quite instructive. Joel means Lord God. Jo is short for Jehovah or Lord, and then El is short for Elohim or God. Lord God. Every time they said Joel, they should have been reminded of who <laughs> was truly Lord of the universe, that it was the Lord God. And this is what God said through Joel. Hear this, you leaders of the people. Listen, all who live in the land. In your history, has anything like this happened before? Tell your children about it. In the years to come, let your children tell their children. Pass the story down from generation to generation. Well, what could be so severe? What could be such an incredible thing that God would say, tell your children, and then so it goes to your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren. What was that message? Well, they were supposed to cry. They were supposed to really truly cry about what God had just done in their lives. Huddleston in his book, The Acrostic Summarized Bible, sum sums up these three chapters in Joel as C-R-Y. Cry to avoid judgment, return to God's blessing, and then yield to God's sovereignty. It's a good summary of the book with this acronym of CRY. But what was this devastation that God had just caused? Well, it was a devastation that, that took place uh, around, I think, between 597 and 586. Uh, there at the temple area, because the recipients seemed to be people there in Zion, close to the temple. And the devastation was a locust invasion. You ever given thought to the damage that a locust invasion can do? Most of us, we live in cities and we don't really think about that much. Uh, this is a picture that was taken in a city called Centralia, Pennsylvania, many years ago prior to the locust invasion. Notice how many 
trees there are and all the, the great foliage on the trees. After the lo locust invasion, they took this picture. <laughs> you basically have entire sections of trees that are just gone. Locusts are relentless. Locusts can come and just eat up basically everything in its sight. They have a voracious appetite. And so what Joel says in Joel 1.4 is, after the cutting locusts finished eating the crops, the swarming locusts took what was left. So we have the second type of locust coming. And after them came the hopping locusts, and then the stripping locusts too. We have four types of locusts following after one another. And you think one type of locust can eat up a lot. Imagine there was basically no food left. Now we might think of it, oh, it's, that, that's so sad because, uh, you know, we, I like looking at trees. Trees are very pretty. This is not just aesthetic here. This is survival. Because if the locusts come and eat up your crops, you're gone. Wake up, you drunkards, he says, and weep. Wail, all you wine drinkers. All the grapes are ruined, and all your sweet wine is gone. A vast army of locusts has invaded my land. A terrible army, too numerous to count. Its feet are like lion's feet. Its fangs are like those of a lioness. It's devoured my grapevines and ruined my fig tree, stripping their bark and destroying it, leaving their branches white and bare. The day of the Lord is near, the day when destruction comes from the Almighty. How terrible that day will be. In reality, we actually have two devastating um, disasters happening in Joel chapter 1. The first one is the locusts. But after the locusts, we also see God sending a second type of calamity, and that is a drought. You say, wow, Lord, that's quite relentless. First you take away all the, the food, and then you take away all the water. But God loves his people enough to make their lives difficult enough for them to turn their attention toward him. And that's exactly what God did with his people during this time. They copulated, they multiplied, they actually ended up having uh, so many of them. Well, here's an example in Salt Lake, Utah. It looks like a whole bunch of rocks here, doesn't it? Or just a bunch of dirt. All the brown area here is actually millions and millions of locusts who gorged themselves on the crops and then died and were swept into this configuration here. So can you guess what our key word for the book of Joel, Joel is? Yeah, you guessed it. It's the word locust. No book uh, explains clearer about how, this, uh, how a locust invasion came upon the people. But what does the Torah say about locusts? Do you remember back in Deuteronomy? Do you remember Deuteronomy 28? You're getting tired of me actually mentioning it, aren't you? Your towns and your fields will be blessed through obedience. Your children and your crops will be blessed. Remember that? If they're obedient. Fruit baskets, breadboards will be blessed. All these things are going to happen if they truly honor the Lord in verses 1 to 14. But Deuteronomy 28, verse 15, all the way to 68, talk about the opposite for disobedience, that they would be people who missed out on food. They would be people who would be attacked, etc. And the whole idea here, of course, is that the, if the exile came and the people wondered why it came, all they had to do was go read Deuteronomy. Well, later on in that passage in Deuteronomy, it says in verse 38, you will plant much, but harvest little. 
for locusts will eat your crops. Do you catch the point? Do you see what the, the Lord is actually saying here in the book of Joel? This is not a, this is not a natural uh, calamity that's happened here. This is a supernatural work of God that should tell them that they have not been honoring the Lord. And they were to stop and ponder this and wonder, well, in what ways have we not truly honored the Lord? In fact, it will get worse than that, the Lord says. When we get to chapter 2, we find uh, another great warning. Sound the alarm in Jerusalem. Raise the battle cry on my holy mountain. Let everyone tremble and fear because the day of the Lord is upon us. The day of the Lord is a day of darkness and gloom. A day of thick clouds and deep blackness. Suddenly the dawn spreading around the mount, spreading across the mountains. A great and mighty army appears. Nothing like it's been seen before or will ever, ever be seen again. You catch that day, day, that sounds like the book of Zephaniah. In fact, these guys lived probably within a decade of one another, may very well have known one another. What is this plague he's talking about? Verse 3, fire burns in front of them and flames follow after them. Ahead of them, the land lies as beautiful as the Garden of Eden behind them. It's nothing but desolation. Not one thing escapes. They look like horses. They charge forward like war horses. It sounds like maybe they're not war horses, or are they? <laughs> look at them as they leap along the mountaintops. Listen to the noise they make, like the rumbling of chariots, like the roar of fire sweeping across a field of stubble, or like a mighty army moving into battle. The dreadful day of the Lord is great. It is dreadful. Or the day of the Lord is great. It is dreadful. Who can endure? Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. What does that sound like to you? What kind of devastating plague does that sound like to you in these first 12 verses of, of Joel chapter 2? or first 11 verses. Some say, this doesn't sound like anything we know in our realm. These must be supernatural creatures. Others say, no, this, this sounds figurative of many different armies. Others say, no, I th this is really one army, just one huge army that's coming. Others say, no, actually this sounds like chapter one. <laughs> The literal locus of chapter 1, it's, it's happening here in chapter 2 as well. And then others say, well, this is, these are both locusts and armies. And the scholars are all over the map on this one. In fact, I have uh, discovered at least 17 different views of Joel chapter 2. So I'm not going to be super dogmatic about my own view on this. I think since he's saying that these are coming uh, from the north, I think what he's actually saying here is that these are, these are not literal locusts. What we've got happening here is that there is an invasion coming in chapter 2. And I believe it's a, a future invasion because he says it hasn't happened yet, right? He's warning them about it in the future. The imagery is very much heightened more than we see in chapter 1. He talks about earthquakes and signs in the skies. That doesn't seem to be the literal locus that we have in chapter 1. He talks about them being an army. Now, it's true that locusts could be seen as an army, but the literal notation of army would refer to people. So, 
he's saying a mighty, a large and mighty army comes in verse 2. And then verse 11, the Lord thunders at the head of his army. I think what he's actually got here because of this imagery and the army metaphor and especially the fact in verse 20 that he says they come from the north, this is where armies always attacked Israel. The superpowers of the day always attacked Israel from the north. So I think he's actually saying there's an army that's going to come from the north. And that army is actually, it's, it's like locusts in the fact that they're so devastating. And then it really matches the whole idea of enemies invading from the north that we find in other passages as well. It makes sense to me that, that Joel has just seen as this locust invasion and drought and the people still have not repented. And he's saying, we have got to repent of the little things, so to speak, little things, because the Babylonians are going to come back again. They already took 10,000 of us. They're coming back. Jerusalem's going to be destroyed like God said. And he uses this imagery to help heighten the effect that, uh, that the judgment of God is actually going to come. We actually have this same language used of the day of the Lord here in this book that we talked about in Zephaniah as referring to the time of tribulation and millennium or a shorter period of seven years followed by a thousand years of of blessing. And I, and I highlighted in that kind of what all of that looks like as, my, as I understand it. Scholars differ on this quite, uh, quite significantly, but we all do agree that the day of the Lord is a period of, of difficulty that's followed by a period of blessing. And sometimes that period of difficulty was near, in this case, I think in chapter one, uh, or uh, he's talking about something that was quite near in the past. Sometimes looking at the day of the Lord in the future is near. We saw this with Zephaniah where he said that the Assyrians, they were going to see the day of the Lord, and it happened within two decades. But what are they to do? That's probably more important than the timing here. Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning, rend your heart and not your garments. That's what they would do. They would, they would tear their garments when they were in anguish. You know, tearing your garments only shows your anger, anguish. It does not show a heart of repentance. Anyone can tear their clothes. So he says, rend your heart, not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he's gracious and compassionate slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. Do you reject God's discipline? Here they are being disciplined of God, and yet they don't really respond. It reminds me of many people today even my own people. This whole idea of whether God has a special relationship with the United States is kind of interesting. Uh, the moral height of the United States was actually in the 1950s. And the U.S. rebuilt its former enemies, Japan and Korea, back in the 50s. They adopted In God We Trust as the national motto. And they begin to see many people in the U.S. turn to Christ through ministries like Billy Graham, and as well as send out missionaries, more missionaries than any other country. And yet, less and less people seem to think now that there is a that God really does have His hand on the U.S. And there's a there's a discipline, frankly, of the United States that we have seen happen for several decades now. I think the 1960s was actually the turning point. Corporations wanting to prolong the Vietnam War to make more profits. 
making it illegal to pray and read the Bible in schools. Uh, a lot of these things happened in the 60s. Chaos in the streets, assassinations of key leaders like John F. Kennedy and Martin Luther King. And on and on, what God has given his opportunities for this nation to return to its roots. And yet now we see more and more and more violence within the country. And I think God's discipline of the United States is, is quite evident. Many would say the problem is guns, but others would say, no, it's not guns, it's hearts without God, homes without discipline, schools without prayer, courts without justice. What is actually more serious to see some people killed by guns, which certainly is devastating, or to see 78 million abortions, half of births in the U.S. to unwed mothers. I read recently that 110 million Americans have a sexually transmitted disease. Friends, that, that's half of the adult population. The U.S. being involved in the longest war in U.S. history uh, right now. The U.S. has been under the disciplining hand of God in order that the country might turn back to him. And it is my regular prayer for my country, even though I do not live there. The Lord has called me to Asia uh, for the majority of my adult life. But I want my country to come back to him. There's discipline of individuals as well uh, because individuals don't seem to really learn when God disciplines them. And the examples of that are just too great to be enumerated. We could all uh, list many, many examples and perhaps you yourself are an example of that. I don't make excuses, I make results is one of the sayings of the, the self-made man nowadays. We could share our stories. Some of us have played with sin until we just finally got disgusted with ourselves. Others of us have become so placent, complacent that um, we hardly give God a thought. I had one man tell me in my church, boy, you know, I go the entire week without thinking about God. And I said, well, my friend, <laughs> you need to be in his word to bring your thoughts back to him. You need to be talking to him. And as a result, even in our churches, we lack love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Is it any surprise? God's calling us to repentance. He's calling us to, to a change of mind in who we place our trust He's saying, trust me, repent, turn back from what you're trusting and trust me. And then show the fruits of repentance by a change of behavior. So we see in this book that discipline should, it should bring repentance. It, that may seem obvious, but the frank reality is, is that discipline normally doesn't bring repentance because people's hearts are stubborn. Unfortunately, it did not bring repentance for the listeners and the readers that Joel's referring to. But will they actually eventually be repentant? The answer, of course, is yes. And this, this book, like uh, many of our prophets, ends with a, a note of encouragement. Because he says repentance not only will bring, uh, or, or that, uh, this one, discipline, will bring repentance, but then the next one is repentance will bring restoration. So the discipline leads to repentance, and repentance leads to restoration. As we get to the end of the book, we see that changing our minds about God leads God to changing our future. And the latter part of the book is actually a book, uh, a part of uh, deliverance. There's a restoration that comes when the people 
will finally turn to the Lord. And what a wonderful thing to realize that Israel's repentance will bring forgiveness, deliverance, and restoration. Verse 18, then the Lord will pity his people and jealously guard the honor of his land. The Lord will reply, look, I'm sending you grain and new wine and olive oil, enough to satisfy your needs. You'll no longer be an object of mockery among the surrounding nations. I will drive away these armies from the north. I will send them into the parched wastelands. Those in the front will be driven into the Dead Sea and those at the rear to the Mediterranean. The stench of the rotting bodies will rise over the land. Surely the Lord has done great things. And so some are going to be driven west, some are going to be driven east. And we see actually here God's future protection of Israel. We'll see more of this when we get to Daniel uh, chapter 12. We'll see more of this when we're in Ezekiel 38 and 39. But here's a little bit of it in Joel. There's many contrasts here with what he says in chapter 1 to what he says in chapter 2. He's talking about the land mourning under the drought. Remember that in chapter 1? But now we see after the nation repents, the land will be glad. Do not rejoice, O land, or do not fear, O land. Rejoice and be glad, for the Lord has done great things, he says. Instead of the animals groaning and wandering and hungry, he talks about how the animals just have no pasture and the goats bleat in misery. But when we get to chapter 2, verse 22, it says, Don't be afraid, you animals of the field, for the wilderness pastures will soon be green. God cares for animals too, you know. The land that's barren and unproductive. He says, it's destroyed my vineyards and ruined my fig trees. These, this famine, these locusts, but they'll grow. They'll be fruitful, they'll be productive. The trees will again be filled with fruit. Fig trees and grapevines will be loaded down once more. Do you realize that when the Lord Jesus comes back and Israel entrusts themselves to him, it's going to actually have an impact on the land itself. Instead of drought, uh, wild animals crying out like we saw in Joel's time, God's going to say, rejoice, re you people of Jerusalem. Rejoice in the Lord your God, for the rain he sends demonstrates his faithfulness. Thank God for the rain and the grain and the wine and the oil that were pretty devastated in chapter 1. He says that will be plentiful after Israel's repentance. The threshing floors will be again be piled high with grain and the presses will overflow with new wine and olive oil. It's like the people are going to just jump on those grapes and they're going to be so rejoicing in God's harvest. And that damage that's done by the locusts, the various types of locusts, well, it's going to be made up for by God. The Lord says, I'll give you back what you lost to the swarming locust, the hopping locust, the stripping locust, and the cutting locust. It was I who sent this great destroying army against you. And so we see God actually saying that he's going to richly bless his people after repentance. And no wonder why Peter, at the day of Pentecost, he actually quoted in Acts 2, he quoted Joel 2, 28, 29. He says that this amazing response to the people, 3,000 people saved on the day of Pentecost, that really is the beginning. That, that, that was one of the fulfillments of what Joel was actually saying. Because God said, then after doing all those things, I'll pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. In those days, 
I will pour out my spirit even on servants, men and women alike. What a wonderful picture, is it? Isn't it? That God is going to actually pour out his spirit. Now, some say this means that all of the Lord's people will be prophets. Interestingly, uh, everyone's going to be a prophet. That's how some people have understood this. He's not actually saying that. He's saying, no, only various types of people are going to be prophets. Old men, young men, women. And then he also says, I will cause wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun will become dark and the moon will turn blood red before the great and, that great and terrible day of the Lord arrives. Now let me ask, did that happen on the day of Pentecost? Did you see the sun darkened and the moon turned blood red? This part, Peter actually did not quote in Acts 2. He's not saying this is a total fulfillment of what Joel chapter 2 was saying, but he's saying that God has begun a great work in this present day, in our church age. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For some on Mount Zion and Jerusalem will escape, just as the Lord has said, these will be among the survivors whom the Lord has called. So God began a great thing at Pentecost, but there's still a harvest yet to come when Israel uh, truly entrusts themselves to the Lord. We see this more clearly when we get into chapter three. When God restores Israel as a nation, he will judge the nations for abusing him, for abusing Israel. At that time, at the time of those events, says the Lord, when I restore the prosperity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather the armies of the world into the valley of Jehoshaphat. Now, where is that valley of Jehoshaphat? This map portrays it as the northern part of the valley of the Kidron that goes up to the north side of this old city of Jerusalem. Can't say I know that that's exactly where it is. Uh, many would say they really don't know where it is, but the Lord certainly knows. And he says, there I will judge them for harming my people, my special possession, for scattering my people among the nations for, and for dividing up my land. Do you catch what the Lord is saying here? He's saying in the last days, there will, be, there will come a plan to divide up the land of Israel. Does that sound a little familiar to you? And he says he's going to judge people for dividing up his land. Joel 3, verse 2. Benjamin Netanyahu said, Israel's the only place in the Middle East where Christians are free to practice their faith. Is it true? As far as I know, what other country can Christians practice their faith in the, in the Middle East, freely practice their faith as they can in Israel? And yet Israel has such a, uh, a hardness, spiritually speaking, even though evangelism is not prohibited. And that's because there's all, all kinds of issues that they're facing there. Netanyahu also said, if the Arabs put down their weapons today, there would be no more violence. If the Jews put down their weapons today, there would be no more Israel. Um, he's saying that we need to defend ourselves. In some sense, he's right. But in another sense, ultimately, it's God who's going to defend Israel. And God has a, has a plan for these people. God is working his plan out. They threw dice to decide which of my people would be their slaves. They traded boys to obtain prostitutes and sold girls enough for enough wine to get drunk. And we covered this earlier about how Tyre and Philistia would come and take the people of Judah and sell them over to the Greeks, which had happened uh, during the time of Joel. But God says he's going to bring them back. But I will bring them back from all the places to which you sold them, and I will pay you back for everything you've done, he's saying to Israel's enemies. I will sell your daughters and sons, the sons and daughters to the people of Judah, and they will sell them to the people of Arabia. 
a nation far away, I, the Lord, have spoken. Say to the nations far and wide, get ready for war. Call out your best warriors. Let your fighting men advance for the attack. Hammer your plowshares into swords. Does that sound a little familiar? <laughs> Isaiah, he's taking Isaiah's language and reversing it. He's saying it's time for war now because God is going to come and protect his people. Train even your weaklings to be warriors. Come quickly, all you nations everywhere. Gather together in the valley. And now, O Lord, call out your warriors. Let the nations be called to arms and let them march to the valley of Jehoshaphat. There I, the Lord, will sit to pronounce judgment on them all. Swing the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, tread the grapes, for the winepress is full. The storage vats are overflowing with the wickedness of his people. Thousands upon thousands are waiting in the valley of decision. There the day of the Lord will soon arrive. The sun and moon will grow dark and the stars will no longer shine. The Lord's voice will raise, will roar from Zion and thunder from Jerusalem. The heavens and the earth will shake, but the Lord will be a refuge for his people, a strong fortress for the people of Israel. Then you will know that I, the Lord your God, live in Zion, my holy mountain. Jerusalem will be holy forever, and foreign armies will never conquer her again. In that day, the mountains will drip with sweet wine, and the hills will flow with milk. Water will fill the stream beds of, Jer of Judah. A fountain will burst forth from the Lord's temple, watering the arid valley of Acacia's but Egypt will become a wasteland and Edom become a wilderness because they attacked the people of Judah and killed the innocent people in their land. But Judah will be filled with people forever and Jerusalem will endure through all generations. I will pardon my people's crimes, which I have not yet pardoned. And I, the Lord, will make my home in Jerusalem with my people. God says, I'm going to dwell. I'm going to dwell with you there. God says, I will pardon. The Lord dwells in Zion. Your trust in the Lord alone will bring his blessing. God's restoration of my country and God's restoration of your country is really going to be tied in to the extent to which our countries really entrust themselves to the Lord God. And the frank reality is, is that pretty much all of our countries have need to repent and really need to turn to the Lord. In terms of geography, <laughs> the United States is actually quite a conservative country. All the counties noted in red are considered conservative. Only the ones in blue are, are, uh, are not so conservative. And as we saw in the, con in the confirmation of Neil Gorsuch, God is, God is working. <laughs> and we shall see in the days ahead whether the country truly turns to the Lord. Um, but I hope your vision is the same as the vision of my church that I pastor in Singapore, where our vision really is centered around love. I mean, we're not big on all kinds of fancy plans and all that. The, the real issue is, do we love God? And if we love God, then it should widen out to love the church. And if we really love the church, are we not going to widen out and love the nations? That's really what God wants for all of us, to love him and the church and the nations. So what should we do when we're disciplined? Back to our, our original question. Here's what the Lord, I think, is telling us to do. I noted it earlier. Let discipline bring repentance. And repentance bring restoration. 
I think that's really what Joel is saying. That God disciplines us to get our attention so that we'll change our focus to really truly trust Him. That's repentance. And then God's response to all that is to restore us in ways that we've never dreamed. Discipline should lead to repentance. Repentance should lead to rest, will lead to restoration. Be disciplined, or you will be disciplined. Like Richard Foster's book says, Celebration of Discipline. Do you like discipline? <laughs> Are you a disciplined person? I hope seeing Joel's message here will help you to be more disciplined in the things that really matter. We are not to despise the Lord's discipline because he's like a loving father who hugs us and kisses us after he has to spank us because he loves us enough to spank us. So some questions for you. And if you're in a small group and you're watching this on YouTube, may I encourage you just to take some time and think through these questions. Number one, do you need God to strip you of everything before you repent? I mean, what really will it take for God to work in your life so that you truly repent, so that you truly trust Him alone? Secondly, is God disciplining you to get your attention on Him once again? It's good for us to really look at our lives and say, wow, is this the Lord's discipline in my life right now? I wonder if it really is. I'm not saying that all difficulty that comes in our lives is God's discipline, but the Lord certainly can use it in our lives, can't he? And have you considered fasting? We see fasting noted twice in this book. Sometimes we get the idea that fasting is old and archaic and certainly not for our day. Why wouldn't it be for our day? I found the discipline of fasting to be one of the best uh, disciplines in my own life to focus my attention truly on the Lord, give me the time where I don't have to spend time in food purchase and food preparation and food consumption and food cleanup. My wife and I try to save the time in doing all those and just during those meal times, instead of having a meal come before the Lord. And I would recommend that you consider it yourself so that you can be disciplined.